This is Hannibal here from thehannibaltv.com. And today we have a special guest from the world famous Guerrero wrestling family. He's been in NWA, WCW. He's wrestled in Mexico. He's wrestled in WWE, also known as Lasertron and the Gobbledygooker. None other than Hector Guerrero. How are you doing today, sir? Oh, you got your Lasertron mask. <laughs> sure, I got it right here, brother. I got one of the originals. They have two originals from the very beginning. Uh, how you doing, uh, Scott? It's just my pleasure to be on your show. It's uh, always a a uh, pleasure just uh, you know talking about wrestling and things that uh, that was in the past, but you know very much in our future and. Uh, it's just a, it's just an honor. Thank you so much for the privilege. Well, it's a pleasure having you on. You're of course the son of the legendary Gory Guerrero. Could you start off by telling us what it was like growing up in a wrestling family? Yeah, you have a wrestling ring in your backyard, <laughs> and it's fun, but it's dangerous. And then having a father that was so strict and uh, like uh, you know he was like you know. You'd be, he taught us from the very, very first things of rolling and learning how to uh, defend ourselves in the, in the ring. And then uh, he taught us about applying holes and, and that wrestling was a chess game. And, you know, that wills did overcome in the chess game. And you just knew how to, how to, how to use that power, how to use that leverage when you needed to. And you did it. And if you knew how to do it, you could do very good. And for the people that aren't familiar with your father, I know he teamed with El Santo. He's one of the all-time greats in Mexico as far as legendary wrestlers. Could you tell us a little bit about the history of your father wrestling in Mexico? Gory, of course, uh, has to do with blood, right? And he was known as a bleeder. Yes. He started as uh, Joe Morgan, if I remember right. And because of the fact that he was born in Ray, Arizona, and then he was raised in Mexico, in uh, Guadalajara, Mexico. And uh, he, uh, he, he started in the school with, the, uh, with the Diablo Velasco, was one of his trainers. He went in to, uh, to, to box. He wanted, he wanted, he went, to, he went in, in, in Guadalajara and he was looking for boxing, but then he saw wrestling and he got into wrestling and he really loved wrestling and he got into it. Uh, uh, he met up with El Santo about back then, but not in Guadalajara when he went to, and he made his way into Mexico City because the Mecca was Mexico City. And it was Empresa Mexicana de Lucha Libre, which is E-M-L-L. And then uh, the uh, Luderoff, the, the old man, the real original, the one that uh, he actually won the lottery and that's how he got himself started in wrestling. So... Uh, they had a lot of a lot of wrestlers at that time. Uh, what is it? God, some of the names, man, that, that they go back. And uh, my dad, El Santo, but even before that, you had other other great wrestlers like Tarzan Lopez, uh, my uncle Enrique Yanez, with my dad later on married his, his sister, which is my mother. So it's all kind of like a family in families, you know. I have a cousin the name is Javier Yanez, and he is a very good wrestler. And uh, and his him and his brother are very good uh, judo judo uh, judo guys who were national champions in Mexico. But let's go back to my dad and El Santo. El Santo and him became a, a very famous pair as a tag team, as heels, as bad guys. And they were called uh, they were they were they would cause a lot of a lot of stuff. My dad was always known for causing uh, uh, rights. In Mexico City. As a matter of fact, one of my brothers, Armando, uh, which is my my brother Mando, he's named after one of the riots that my dad caused when he was born. My brother Mando, which is four years older than I am, was born the night that my dad had one of the biggest riots that made uh, newspaper headlines in all Mexico City, and my dad was the one that caused it. <laughs> he was he was quite a guy. He never backed down, even if public went after him, and he backed the public up. I've heard many stories of that. But him and El Santo became like legends. And um, of what I understand, my dad was very, very, very famous and very, very well put. Uh, I got some pictures with him with holding three belts. 
And he had he was at one time he was the uh, middleweight, the welterweight, and the lightweight champion of Mexico. And that time the NWA had given the lightweight lightweight belts to uh, to Mexico. And my dad was three of those champions at one time. At one time, I actually had that picture. Uh, uh, El Santo and him became very famous. El Santo went and uh, went on into the movies, and then he became like untouchable. He was so so famous, like. My gosh, everybody, Any anytime El Santo came to work for my father, when my father became a promoter in, in Juarez and in El Paso back in the 60s and 70s, it was a it was a sold out houses every time it was so he was so famous. But that's more of a, of a legend that that they both created. And uh, it's it's history. Does that answer a little bit of your question? Yeah, is it true at one point uh, your dad actually caught some type of disease related to bleeding as well, but he overcame it? I don't know anything about that. He never told me that. Okay. And if and if somebody knows that about that, like maybe my aunt, my mother. Well, she's rest, God rest, you know, she's she's gone now. My my mother never told me something like that. Um, you know. A lot of people know more me than I know because they probably saw him, but everybody that saw my father are probably already, you know, gone or getting close to him. Yeah, I, I think it may have been in Eddie's book or something, but... Yes, Eddie has a lot of the history and um, because my mother's, you know, told us a lot of the history. Uh, there is a lot of history with my father, and I want to say that he was a patriarch. And he, to me, he was the best of us all. Yes, and definitely. I mean, Eddie... The most famous, maybe because of the 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 way television and media, but my my father was like like top dog, man, top 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 dog, and you know if he would have been reached out in world like did like the WWE it does in the world, I'm sure he would have been as popular, more popular than my brother Eddie. I don't see that. I say that with a lot of respect. Uh, I love my brother Eddie, and I miss him very dearly, and so I do my father, and I and I do Chavo Senior. And my mother, and uh, anybody that's lost anybody, family members, uh, we uh, we hold them dears in our heart. But we know that our family, uh, kind of, was a God fearing family. And my father, and my mother, always taught us about our Lord, and His name is Jesus, which is Yahusha, in the real the real name because that means Savior in, in uh, Hebrew. And He He was in, implanted in our hearts. And we were taught that way from the very beginning. Now, some of us, they're kind of wild and kind of crazy <laughs> yes, because the girl blood is still in us. But, uh, but we know who our Savior is. Is it true that your father was also kind of the behind-the-scenes enforcer in Mexico for various promoters? Yeah, very, he was a pistol, if you know what that is. Yeah, uh, yeah he was a pistol. There's there some incidents that happened to me when I came to Mexico. Well, in my early, I started in 1973. In about 74, I decided to start going to Mexico City. And I would book myself through my cousin, uh, Javier Yanez, which is my mom's, uh, you know, brother. My mom, look, my father married my, my, my uncle Henry's daughter, I mean, uh, sister, which is my mother. And so we became a family. So Javier would, would, would bring me in into Mexico and I had a lot of opportunities to go into Mexico and uh, there was a lot of things that happened there that, that were interesting you know can't probably talk about them over the air but uh, it's just a, it's something that you you don't forget and you don't uh, it, it, and it doesn't go away go ahead is it true I don't know if it was like that in your father's day but I heard in the more modern era that there's a lot of drugs in the Mexican wrestling scene. I, I know that uh, that your family name wasn't really attached to any of that, but I've heard that compared to other places, like it's a bit more wild backstage as far as the backstage environment. Look, I, I my my father's career started probably about in nineteen late late nineteen thirties, and all the girls we were involved later on, but I'd never heard that from my father. And neither did I hear that from anybody around that was to my father. And if the guys that were kind of crazy, you know, they drank beer. We did all wrestlers. I've known that. We like to drink their beers and, you know, have their cocktails and all that. But that that, you know, that what you're saying, I've never heard that. And I'm not and I'm not lying to you. I'm telling you the truth. 
And uh, I heard, I would hear certain circumstances that might have been, but it wasn't like many of the top stars. Now, he's talking about the guys that were in there underneath way back. I don't know, because I was never there around, and I wouldn't say that because I don't know. There's a fan on here, Mike, that wants to know if you've ever run into Tito Santana. What are your thoughts on him? Oh, man, he's super. He's a nice guy. I, I, Tito is a big image of, 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 of us Mexicans because he's tall and he's bigger than Tavo was bigger. I mean, he's taller, you know what I mean? And uh, no, Tito's a super nice guy. And uh, I like his ring savvy. I have a lot of respect for him. And he's my countryman. He's my, uh, you know, he's one of one of our one of our beloved Mexican wrestlers that that has had very very good, uh, what do you call it, uh, you know, history in the in the in the United States and the American wrestling. And he's been very very popular. And I have a lot of respect for him. When I interviewed Tito, he said it was kind of between him and and Bret Hart on who was going to get that title push. Do you think if they had gone with Tito, he could have had as much success as Bret did? Oh, yeah. Tito is uh, – he's very charismatic. And uh, and, and nobody could take that away from him. And charisma has a lot to do. You see, uh, you go to certain wrestlers, and they can be, like, really super good, but they got no charisma. It's – it's good, you know, but they have no charisma. And I could name some names, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, we. I think the fans know who you're talking about. Mike gives a little tip here and says, any thoughts on the passing of Hector Garza? Yeah, you know, I really like Hector. Uh, I worked with him in, in WCW, and he was coming in, and I was going out. So um, they usually favor the ones that are staying. And I had a very good match with him. I really enjoyed him. I thought he was a very, very good-looking young man, and a lot of the girls thought so too, you know, <laughs> so I'm sure that's why they were pushing him pretty strong, but I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, how the circumstance happened, oh, man, that's, I, I saw, I see that, I, I, you can still go back and look at it, and, and you can see that that was a horrible uh, accident, and, and those around him did not realize that he was that that had happened to him and and it's not their fault it's not anybody's fault it's just a circumstance that that happens with Hector and uh you know he's my tocayo in Mexico when you have the same last name you say tocayo and you have kind of like affinity with them and so my my uh my respects for him he was a very good wrestler and he uh what I say, arrest, you know, in Mexico, you know, everybody goes, oh, he does a lot of, a lot. I mean, let me, let me give you a little bit of history now. There's some things that are called ring wrestling. And there's some things that are called flying acrobatics. Nowadays, there's a lot of that. And I kind of helped bring it in. I know that because I used to do a lot of it myself. But I also wrestled. Uh, Hector can do, Hector could do the both. He could wrestle and he could do everything that he did. You know, and uh, so it was a, it was a very, very uh, sad day, especially for those that knew him and those that, you know, had respect for him, especially I'm sure his family, his mother and his family are, are very, very hurt. Uh, but, you know, that's that's a circumstance. And that's why we need we need to believe in the creator, you know, and because we're all going to meet up and the, in, you know, in paradise, and you know, and you know, if you accept him, you're there, and you're not. Well, that's not a good deal. That's not a good place either. Well, well, speaking of that, we just lost the Iron Sheik. Did you have any interactions with him over the years? Very, very few. I, in, in the American Wrestling Association, when the Guerreros were involved with with the Ganyas, which I have deeply respect for for the Ganyas, and golly, yeah. You know, no, no, nothing but accolades and respect for them. And they respected us and they liked us. So let's get back to the Iron Sheik. He was there, you know, and uh, he was always an interesting guy. Uh, he knew his wrestling and he knew how to, you know, control himself in the ring. That's what I'm going to say about him. Uh, I didn't know him more personally that I could say something. I'm sorry about his family. And, you know, and I, and I send my deepest condolences. 
Another guy we just lost was a, a good friend of mine and a mentor to me, superstar Billy Graham, who was buried in the same cemetery as your brother, Eddie. Do you have any memories of him? Oh, yeah. Much, much, much memories. I remember him as he, as he, uh, as he came into the, the limelight and he came into New York. Before New York took over the whole situation, when they were still in, 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 the, in the northern the northeastern in northeastern states when they were up there in their in their states and and everybody you know every, everybody talked about the big apple you know and uh when uh when bruno san martino met met a guy that was you know coming here as big strong and, you know and this is guy and you got you got here and then you see him how he is in the ring i said okay he's not just the body this guy can wrestle and he knows how to how to motivate a crowd and knows how to take a match. And I said, this was great. And then when he came, I came to Florida and I wrestled about the second or third time. It was the third time, no, the second time, because I did three tours in, in, in Florida. And now I live in Florida, so I ended up here. So anyway, we could just go back to the tours. He was in my second tour with my brother Chavo and I were, were tagging as a banditos which is a great, you know, I love working with my brother Chavo. And, uh, but we were very close because he was a bad guy. We were the bad guys. So when you go to the towns, you go together and we rode many, many times with him. And I loved every time again. I still remember him uh, in the in the dressing rooms and he'd grab a dumbbell, right? And he'd go and he'd be, and he'd be going, he'd be going. And we'd come, hey, Billy, what's going on? And he'd say, hey, get ready for the Big Apple. Going back to the Big Apple, going back to the Big Apple, and he was pumping iron. And uh, but most of all, I want to tell you about him is that he was a Christian, and he loved the Lord, and the Lord loved him. I know it. He uh, he and I talked many times later on, and uh, there was a thing that was in, in uh, what was it, athletes in, in ministry, and that was held in in Arizona, in Phoenix. And we went down there, and uh, I had a great time talking with him. Uh, the times that I had the opportunity to talk, and he—he he was the one that was the head of when Eddie's, when Eddie's, uh, you know, at Eddie's funeral. He was the one that was leading everything, and uh, he's pretty strong in what he said to Vince and what he said to others. So uh, I have my deep respect for him and and his wife now. That you know, she probably misses the heck out of him. So do we, you know. But if you know we have that again, we go and come back to the to the Creator, and you believe in Him, and He re you receive Him as Lord and Savior, then you're going to be fine because you know what you're going to into into eternity, into paradise, and that's where we all meet up. Didn't at one point He also make sure that your family got into the WWE Hall of Fame because for some, like to actually watch it one year or something, maybe the year that He was inducted? Look, I if it did, I don't know anything about that. Okay. And anybody, any, the only person that I know that's in the Hall of Fame is Eddie. Right. I don't know if he's any of the other girls, you know. And but uh, remember, there's a there was there was that wrestled. You got Chav, you got Gory, Chavo, Mando, myself, Eddie. I'm talking in ages, and then Junior, which is Chavo Senior's son. And uh, I don't know if we're gonna have some more. Uh, Shaw. Shaw's tried it for a while. I was hoping she was going to stick with it. I was so ready to teach her what I know in wrestling. I know a lot. But, you know, my grand, my grandma and I were very close friends. And uh, he's the son of Eddie Grant. And before Mike passed away, we were talking. And he says, Hector, you remember the way we were used to wrestle? And we wrestled like, you know, we didn't choreograph. We went up there and we wrestled each other. And it was like a chess game, like I told you earlier, you know, and if you knew how to put your strength where here or there, you're going to get advantage of that chess game. And that's how we learn. And he might tell, you know what, that's a, that's that art that you and I know, look how he said, that art of wrestling is this is long gone. It's a forgotten, it's a forgotten art of, of wrestling. So um, I'd like to teach it, but, you know, they all think they need to do all these triples and all this it looks like uh looks like a flying trapeze now uh but then you know they put a lot of drama into it now too we used to create the drama within the match by how we wrestled each other 
not by how they acted or how they did somebody run in and did that. No, we did it in the ring. And that's the art of it. And uh, not too many people can do that anymore. No, I agree. And and now there's the there's so many hours of wrestling and there's so many people that do acrobatics. It's not as special anymore as it once was uh, when there was fewer people doing it. But I agree with you. Shawl has potential. I've seen some of her matches. And if, if she ever gets back into it, we'd definitely be interested in using her up here in Canada. So hopefully she will get the bug again to get back into wrestling because she has the look for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? And, um, our shawl, shawl, not only that, I mean, uh, just, you know, we all have to be teachable because, you know, uh, even that, I, I had a problem with that until my dad settled me down and understand, made me understand. And we all had that. You know, we come up with, we think we know more than the teacher. And that's, <laughs> that's human intuition, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, Shaw, Shaw, I can, I can see that she has it. You know, it's a gift and it's not, it's not gone without her. It, it is, it is there. All she has to do is develop it if she wants to. Now, I read in Eddie's book that he used to get into a lot of fights growing up as Gory's son. He seems like a lot more fiery personality than you, but did you have the same issues in high school? And did you did you, did you grow to high school with your brothers and have them to kind of back you up, or were you on your own? I was on my own. <laughs> my, Mother was more of the fighter and been more of the fighter. I was more of the diplomat. And I... If I didn't have to fight, I wasn't going to fight. You know what I mean? If they came and they threw the first punch, oh, yeah, you know, you're going to get a response. And you're not going to like it. And, and, you know, that the Guerrero came out of me then. But I, I hold that back. And, you know, knowing our Savior and knowing our circumstances, you have to you have to learn how to hold that back. And then when it's, when it's time to do it, then you do it, you know. But, uh, you know, I, I always look at... at uh, at, at the savior in his last moments he did fight back and he took everything they gave him and yet it meant so much for all of us to learn what he did for us and that's 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 a great thing now uh that the rest of the girls oh yeah we have to fight we did you know and we did when we would mostly in the ring sometimes because People don't realize a lot of a lot of temperatures flare in the ring. Oh, I didn't like that move. Oh, hey, here, bam! You get right in the chin and you're bleeding in the mouth. Turn around and then you go, bam! And you hit him and you go, hey, that's your receipt. And then you know it starts. So a lot of people don't realize that, but it does happen, and it happens. And there's a lot of things happen in the dressing room too. Promoters don't like it, and you get in a lot of trouble with that. But that's just that's just the, the nature of the beast. And as far as your father, he actually ran the El Paso territory back in the territory days. Could you tell us a little bit about that territory? Oh, well, he started it back. My dad uh, was a traveling wrestler and had a family. He traveled in, between Mexico and the United States. And usually because in Mexico, you know, you're making pesos in the United States, you're making dollars. And back then when he was wrestling at that time, there was 12 pesos per dollar. So it's 12.50 per dollar, exactly. So you're making more money when you make dollars to Mexican pesos. So my dad would travel from Mexico to different places in the United States. One of them was uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, working for the, working for, uh, who was it? that time it was those that are in charlotte and I'll, it'll come back to me the crockett, crockett the crockett yeah the, the crockett but the but the dad talking about the dad yeah i think the crockett, crockett senior maybe yes crockett senior and then and then he also he worked for uh for saint joseph missouri i don't know who was who was in charge of and i think bob guy if i remember right if i might i might be wrong and then he also worked for Leroy mcgurk and I remember that because I worked for Leroy McGurk and Leroy talked very highly of my dad to me and respected him. And I respected him very much, as did Danny Hodge and my dad. And, and I respected Danny, too. I got to meet him, too. He wrestled. You were free one of my matches. I loved it, man. He gave me all kind of advice and 
as Freddie Blassie did too in California. Let's get back to uh, to what we were saying. Uh, so, in wrestling, you have a lot of a lot of a lot of opportunities to meet with so many that you have you're you're always being influenced by the beauty of of the older generation, which now they don't respect. And I wish they did because you know what, they might learn something from us. But eh, you know, maybe they'll learn it someday, and maybe when it happens to them, then they'll say. Oh, <laughs> right. Hundred percent. And as far as you mentioned, sometimes wrestlers had to take care of stuff in the dressing room. Did you ever witness any of these backstage fights in the dressing room? Look, if they did, you don't talk about them, and you do your. That's respectful. That's a that's a wrestler thing. You don't you don't say those things and uh they happened but it just i'm sorry you know i'm not going to talk about that about anybody or good about anybody about that i know you guys would love to hear that but uh that's kind of personal and every wrestler you know i'm sure every wrestler like i me if it involved me i wouldn't like people talking about that about me so you know i'm, I'm going to respect everybody and you spent some time in the Los Angeles territory working for Mike LaBelle. How was the LA territory in those days? Oh, I loved it, man. Uh, you had, let me see, let me tell you, I'll give you the run. Uh, you had uh, Wednesday nights, they would start TV nights, would be TV at the Olympic Auditorium. Thursdays, it went from being, uh, it used to be, it used to be Bakersfield, but then they decided to do something different. It was a spot show. And that could be anywhere in, in uh, Southern California. Bakersfield, they changed it from Thursday to Saturday. And the reason was because one time we were in Bakersfield and it snowed us in. And we couldn't back, get back over the mountain to get back into L.A. So they had to stand the plane for us. So Michael Bell, which is a promoter, decided to change uh, Bakersfield from Thursday to Saturdays. Fridays was uh, was the Olympic Auditorium. That was the big night. That was the uh, biggest, biggest show down in L.A. Then you had Saturday night, which I told you was Bakersfield, or before you, before that it was a spot show. Sundays was San Bernardino. Um, Mondays were Ventura, and I used to love going because you go right right next to the Ventura Highway, and you go all the way up there, and you wrestle in Ventura. And when you're coming back, you're going right back, you know, the 101, which is a Ventura Highway, and it's just it's just it was just beautiful. Yeah, I just love that. Love the love the people there. And then Tuesday night we were in San Diego, and then back on Wednesday to TV. So that's what's kind of like what the LA looked like. I met a, that was my first my first uh, territory in the United States that I wrestled. I had been previously. I, I was seventy eight, so five years. I started in seventy three as a pro. And I started teaching wrestling classes when I was twelve, and that was way before that. So I've been wrestling since I was twelve years old. I'm now 69. <laughs> so it's come a long ways. Well, you look great for 69. Of course, you ended up winning the NWA Junior Heavyweight Championship. How did you get that opportunity? Oh, you, you got this, it right you there. Mean this one? You mean this one? <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a that was a thing with uh, uh I was talking to Dusty one time, and Dusty Rose, he was the uh, he was a booker for uh for the Crockett's in, in, uh, in North Carolina. And I said, Dusty, we need to do, you know, what do we do something for the kids? And he was all for it. And so uh, at that time, you know, you had Megatron and you had Ultraton and all these things where the kids were on TV and they were really excited about that. And also uh, they, they, they come up with a, with a game called laser tag. And believe it or not, some of the guys we used to get together, we'd play laser tag and we'd have fun. We'd meet up and on our days off. We go play these or tag against each other. So it was it was fun. It was a pretty pretty fun time. But uh, this guy right here just decided we decided to do this. Is one of my original maps. You can tell you that's a worn, rain worn. There. This is my other one. I got another one here. And so we decided to do laser tron, and it and uh, and Dusty went off for it, and uh, so. Legatron got uh, got the best of Denny Brown and became the NWA World Junior Champion. Champ. And this is a replica of the belt from the mine was donated to me, and I was 
very, very thankful for him to doing it. Bruce Owens. I love him very much. He's a very, very good friend and he's a very good Christian. Uh, so that's how it happened. And then I stayed the I stayed the champion, except, you know, really truly honestly, uh, when the Crockett territory was really flourishing, they had they had two pounds a night. So if you were on the big towns, you were making some big money. If you were in the small towns, you weren't making so much money. So at that time, they, they had joined Boogie Woogie Man, Jimmy Valiant, and Lasertron together. And we were hitting all the main events, but in the lesser towns, if you understand what I'm trying to say, the smaller towns. And so you're getting, you know, not, not great pay and not bad pay, but you're not getting the cream of the crop. Then once in a while they give you one or two during that week, or you, you have one, and then the rest of the towns you were all the, you were always doing the other small small towns. So I wasn't making any money, and as a as a professional wrestler, you got to make money because if not, you're not making any money. You're not doing anywhere. So, like you know, with all due respect, you know, I, I respected the Crockett's and I respect Dusty and I respect everybody. But I just made a decision that, you know, I needed to go to uh, greener pastures, and I did. And uh, they, I gave them back the belt. I never lost it. I gave them back the belt. I respected them for it. They respected me back. And I said, thank you very much. And I, to this day, I'm very thankful for the opportunities they gave me because they could have not given me nothing, like anything, right? And so you're thankful for the opportunities that you get. And, you know, maybe someday, someplace, somewhere else, some circumstance will come that'll be a lot better and a lot more favorable. In my case, maybe it already passed <laughs> as far as wrestling goes. But I'm also a teacher. You don't know that. I have, I have, a, I have a kinesiology degree, a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology from the, from the University of Texas at El Paso. So I became a teacher. I have a minor in education. So I've been doing that for, I'm about to retire. And so soon, if my Lord permits me, that's, that's with his permission. Are you a are you a high school teacher? No, I, I am I am K through twelve certified. That means I can teach from kindergarten to twelfth grade. But I prefer uh, I prefer the elementary grades. Ah, the middle school they got too many hormones. High school they know it all. So I say, heck, man, give me the little ones. And now the little ones from maybe third grade or fourth grade fifth grade now they're starting to act the same way and i'm like wow <laughs> but give me my first and second graders and they love me and i love my little kindergartners so i'm happy with them <laughs> now i understand you went on to you mentioned before the american wrestling alliance at one point you won a title with dr d david schultz any memories of working with him Listen, with all due respect, I don't remember winning a title with the, uh, Dr. Schultz. I'm, I don't have any uh, any recollection of that. In the American Wrestling Association, uh, Mondo was the one of the first Guerrero to start wrestling with them. And then Mondo called, uh, they, taught, they, taught, they, they pulled Chavo in, and then they pulled me in. And I'm talking about Chavo Sr. And then we, we did the triple thing, you know, we did the, the, the three, the trios. But I never, never wrestled as a tag team with David Schultz. Please forgive me, but I don't. Well, I don't. we'll correct it now on your Wikipedia because I, I'll, I'll, I just copied and pasted it. That's directly from your Wikipedia. It wow. says in the late '80s you were a world tag team champion in the AWA. But I, no. I believe you. But we're we're setting the record straight. You know, Mondo and I were world tag team champions with the WWF. When they sent the, they, they had these these belts and they sent them to Mike LaBelle. And so they had a big tournament. And Mondo and I were the ones that 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 gained that gained that tournament. We have a picture there to do several pictures that we took together. And we have the belts on us. And we uh, at that time, I remember because the belts were so big that you know we couldn't put them around our waist. Everybody used to put their belts around the waist, so we put them over our shoulders. So that's the way. You know, I guess, and then you started seeing a lot of guys start doing that, too. Did you have much dealings with Vince McMahon Sr.? Well, Vincent, uh, the the only time that I really, really got started, started with Vince was the, during the time that they wanted to do the gobbledygooker. And that was a good thing. That was for the kids. That wasn't for, 
that wasn't for uh, uh, what do you call it for, for the adults. And I didn't. I've never wrestled in in uh, at the Meadowlands. You know what I mean? That's what. I had never been there, so I didn't know what kind of crop it was. So when I broke out of the egg, I was dressed up in the egg, which was six hours in there because they had me in there because they didn't want anybody to know who was in there. And they had a they had a big old uh, wooden box, and then the egg was on top of it. And so I was inside the egg for a long time. So anyway, give me back to there. So when I broke out and I saw that, you know, it was like, wow, man, they were booing it. I mean, a lot of boos, man. And I guess they were expecting maybe Hulk Hogan come out there of the egg because they were calling it exciting at the Survivor Series. Or they were expecting maybe uh, China to come out or something. But then here comes out a, you know, a, a picture of, uh, of a guy in, dressed in a, in a turkey suit, you know, and it was kind of like supposed to be like the San Diego chicken. They were trying to make something like that, but for the kids, and it just, it just, it just, they booed the heck out of it. Anyway, Gene, Gene Okerlund, he says to me, come on, kid, let's get this thing over. So we did. And we went up there, and he, he followed everything I did. I danced with him, and he tried to do stuff. He would fall. Next, next day, he was black and blue, and I'm talking about him. You know and his legs and all that and he tried so hard and i have a lot of respect and you know i know he's rest in peace you know my friend but you know he uh i really do so vince had the right idea it's just in the wrong place now when we did it at the in in uh when the ww at that time wwf went to orlando and we did it and i came out of the gobby gooker it was great it was awesome it was like the kids went crazy not the metal ones. you know you can't do it in the metal ones. so he had the right idea just the one place and uh i believe we all make mistakes and uh, that was just one mistake that we all make and we have to be forgiving to each other and that's it was it them that approached you with that job or were you calling them to try and get jobs prior to the gobbledygooker well i'm going to tell you the truth i'll, I'll tell you the truth here i was calling them because i really wanted to get into the wwe I thought I had a potential, and maybe they'd give me an opportunity, like all of us that try, you know. And uh, so one day I call, I call, and finally somebody picked up the phone and he says, Who is this? I mean, really nasty. I'll tell you what it was. It was Pat Patterson. He says, Hey, he says, What are you, how did, how did you get this number? Because I had got the number for the booking office at, at, in, uh, you know, up in, in, up in Connecticut, Stanford. And he and says, now, don't ever call here again. And they hung up on me. And so I said, you know what? If, you know, they can take it. And I didn't think about it. So I was married to my first wife at that time. And I was home in Tennessee. And I was a gymnastics instructor. And somebody started calling. And it was from them. I don't know who it was. But my wife would pick up the phone. And she'd say, Hey man, it's it's, it's uh, WWF. They want to talk to you. I says I don't want to talk to them. Hang up on them. So she did. They called me about five times. Finally, once I I picked up the phone and it was then, and they said, Hey, don't pick up. Don't don't close. Hector, don't. He says Vince wants to talk to you. So then Vince talked with me and talked to me and you know told me about it and we talked about it and then he uh, handed me over to Pat Patterson, which is interesting. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was interesting. So uh, anyway, that's how it. That's how it happened. That's how. That's how it happened. It, that it didn't last. It didn't last uh, five, six, seven months, and then they gave me my release. And uh, you know, that's the way it was. How did they approach you with explaining the gimmick to you when Vince first talked to you about it on the phone? No, he, he was very, very, uh, very professional, like he is. And like he's been, he was very professional. This this is idea, and I believe that Dusty Rhodes at that time was working with him. Dusty had mentioned my name, that I would be a good a good thing for that. They also wanted to do something different. I heard later on, and uh, they wanted to put me in also as a wrestler, and I would do both. I could do the Gobby Booker thing, and then also wrestle as the uh, as the uh, as a as the bandito. I think that's what they wanted to do. They were going to do me as a bandito as a heel. I'm not a very big guy, you know what I mean? At that time, I was maybe 215, 220, you know, but uh, I could move. And speed was my thing, you know. That's, <laughs> that's I had to because the guys are really big. 
Those guys are really big and heavy too. So was the goggle, gobbledygooker supposed to be like a mascot or an actual wrestler? Well, he was supposed to be a mascot, I believe. And it was supposed to be for the, uh, for like the Survivor Series, you know, and the, for the, you know, Thanksgiving thing, past Thanksgiving holidays. And then uh, later on, I, I probably, they would introduce me as the bandito. And then every, every Thanksgiving Survivor Series, I'd come on, come back out and promote the, you know, promote Survivor Series as a gobbledygooker. That's what I believe they wanted to do. And that would have been really great because, you know, it would have been good, you know. Uh, the money they promised uh, never came through. I didn't. I mean, it's just, I mean, they could say it's hearsay. But I, uh, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not telling you a lie. And uh, But I'm thankful, you know, because my brother, Eddie, they treated him a lot, a lot better. And they treated him well, and they treated my uh, Chavo Jr. well, and they treated Chavo, Chavo Sr. You know, my brother Sr. had some problems, but we all have problems. My gosh, do we all not? You know? Did you hear the story that The Undertaker, who also debuted on that Survivor Series, it might be one of the best Survivor Series of all time, by the way, in my opinion, but did you hear the story that The Undertaker initially thought that he was going to be the guy coming out of the egg? I did, you know, that's, I heard that, I think uh, Nick told me that, Nick Massey, and I said, I never heard that, <laughs> but maybe he did. Now, when they can, when I, when I flew in, they flew me in and, and uh, to go talk, you know, the first time and the limo picked me up at the airport and guess who was there? Mark, you know, the undertaker, he was there sitting next to me. We were talking, they were hiring him at the same time. And we were in debt, but, you know, it makes kind of sense that he, he probably thought that he might have been coming out of the egg, you know, not this character they wanted to do for the children. And I've heard you, uh, I know you did a promo with Coco Beware and maybe some others where you're making the gobbledygooker sounds. Did somebody, like, explain to you what sounds they wanted to hear, or was this Never. you ad-libbing? No, I did ad -lib it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or I just do something because, and then like, the Gobby Gooker had eyes, and when they had eyes, they had eyes like this, right? And they were all the, the white stuff, like here, and you could see those little holes. So let me tell you an incident that happened. So I, they were, they were, they were gonna at Madison Square Garden. So that night, that night, they, they, uh, they told me before the matches, everything before, before the people came in, that they wanted to showcase the Gobby Gooker. I said, okay. He said, and I used to do a routine where I walked in, I flipped over the ring, I landed on my feet, I do, I do the dance, I do a cartwheel, I do a round off, and I do some things that I know how to do, and I and uh, and as I and as as uh, so they they said, okay, well let's 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 let them let's let them have a, a rehearsal, and he said, oh no, Hector's got it, leave it alone, you know, Hector. So okay, I you know I could do it. I've been doing it for like two or three months now, you know. And I said, yeah, I, I can do it. So uh, so they, they said, all right. So the time comes and they turn on the lights and they showcase me. And they, well, forgive me, they turned off all the lights of the, of the of, of Madison Square and they put a spotlight on me. And when I hit the spotlight, I couldn't see because those white eyes lit up like white and I couldn't see out of them. So I couldn't say anything. And, lit, and look, and I need glasses and I still was trying to see out of that. That was a difficult situation. So there, the guys in the back, which I never realized who they were, because I would have probably come back and said something to them, were pushing me and pushing me and saying, hey, you need to get out there. Come on. Hey, you're on. You're on. You're on. And I'm going, man, I can't see. I can't see. So they pushed me out, and I couldn't see the thing. I know that I was out because I could feel the cables on my feet. I started feeling my cables. I walked. I hit my shins. I on the stairs my st i knew i bled because i went back and i was bleeding on my shins and i finally i got in I, I felt the ropes i flipped in i didn't even know if i was flipping inside or outside of the ring but i felt something on my feet and then i landed on my butt and then the lights came on so i got up and acted like i was hurting my you know like i was funny like i did that on purpose like i wanted to do that purpose and then finally, when the lights came on, I did all my whole routine, spotless, not a, not, a, not a, nothing happened. So I come back into the dressing room right after the whole thing. Right? I'm walking upstairs because it was upstairs. And I go through, and Vince is looking at me like he's 
got that look in his face, which not a good look. And I know he was he was a little ticked. I didn't want to say anything. So the gorilla monsoon looks at me. He looks at me like that. And I didn't say anything. I go back and I get into my stuff and I start taking my stuff off. You know, I said, I'm thinking myself, screw this, man. <laughs> so, but finally, gorilla comes. He comes in. He goes. You couldn't see, right? And I go, you think? And then he said, yeah, we finally figured it out. <laughs> but these guys were pushing me, you know, they, they should have they should have done that. But uh, and, and nowadays, of course, it would all be rehearsed and something that they put so much effort into promoting. It doesn't seem like they ever rehearsed with you. Well, yeah, but you see, I could do it. It's just that I couldn't do it blind. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Instead of yeah, being, I mean, dark, it was white. Everything was white. I couldn't see out those holes. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And they were yeah. pushing me, and I finally I felt I I I I was blind. You know, yeah. they didn't realize that 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 lights. Now, if I would have, if we would have rehearsed it, and I would have said, no, 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 cut it, cut it, cut the lights, turn the lights on, let me come out on my own. Don't put, don't shine the lights on me, because I couldn't see worth nothing, man. Was Pat Patterson nicer to you in person? Look, Pat, I'm, I don't, Pat's already gone. We, we shouldn't talk about each other about, you know, Pat was a great wrestler. I saw him wrestle against my dad in El Paso. I got a lot of respect for him for that. He was a great wrestler and knew how to wrestle. Oh, my God, was he great. I mean, I, I saw I saw matches with him with my father, and they were great wrestling matches. So uh, that he that he didn't, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to say nay or or great, you know, but he he treated me uh, that time. That was the truth of what I told you on the phone. Then later on, I just you know I just I I was uh, I was respectful to him, and he was respectful to me too, and that's the way it went. And of course, they brought you back for the battle royal at WrestleMania <laughs> 17. Do you have anything to share about that coming back yeah. as the Gooker after all those years? Yeah. Well, I knew that I was going to be taken out by uh, by uh, tugboat, Fred, you know, and uh, the group, they they told me they couldn't find the old the old because they asked when I when I gave the release papers, I sent them back the uniform, the you know the gobbledygooker, what they had given me, and I sent it back to them. So I don't know what happened to them. They said we don't have it anymore, Hector. We've kind of got a different thing that we've got, and so instead of having the 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 it was like a like a sock that went over with their eyes and they were built for me in my face it was this was a helmet and it had like a little latch and that was it and so i went out on that battle royal and i was i was i was in the air and fred had me up in the air like that. <laughs> he had me way up in the air and i'm going like that and i'm grabbing all of my head because that mask that head was popping out i said fred fred Go ahead, let's get it done because this thing's coming off. So he was, he was cool. He got it done, and uh, but that I had a good time with her, and uh, they gave me an opportunity, and I am thankful for that. And anytime the WWE gives me an opportunity, I'm very thankful. And uh, they, they, I can't say anything bad about them. They given, uh, they did marvelous things with my, with my family, with, uh, you know, inducting my brother in the Hall of Fame, doing things with uh, Eddie doing things with my, talking well about my dad, you know, and talking well about my brother Chavo and, and Chavo Jr., you know. No, you know, life is too short. We treat each other with respect. We treat each other. We forgive each other and we go on. And I'm hoping that. And if they have something against me, well, I'm sorry, you know. I'm sorry if I ever did anything to you. If I did it, forgive me. If not, that's between you and the creator. I know that they eventually put out a gobbledygooker toy. Do you get royalties off of that toy? I don't know. I can't. I don't know. I'm not going to say yay or nay. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. I know there's I heard, several... I heard about it. I yeah. heard about it. I said, that'd be nice. You know, <laughs> you know I'm getting in my older years now. I'm getting old, you know, and getting ready to retire as a teacher. 69. I mean, going to be 69 this year. And, uh, you know. I tell you what, um, every wrestler of one of us, like every pro athlete, and I tell you, I'm, I, I, you know, I don't let them touch my body because here in Florida, I haven't had any surgeries yet. But uh, some of my friends that had wrestlers that I know that have surgeries, they haven't, they haven't come out too good. 
So they always, you know, these these doctors think that they 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 can work wonders, but I don't think so. You know, all the wrestlers that I know that are hurt now, they're even sometimes worse than they were before. So I don't let them touch my body. You know, the only one that touches my body is my Lord. Now, I don't know if you heard about this, but a, a couple of years ago, the gobbledygooker with somebody else playing it oh, won yeah. the WWE 24-7 title. Were you disappointed that, that they didn't use you for that? No, you know what? They were even mocking me. I know that because I saw it. <laughs> it just it made me laugh, you know, because I've never had anything against the McMahons. And that comes from the top. And or whoever whoever they gave it to, you know, but they they treated me right. And I, you know, like I said, I'm not gonna talk bad about anybody, and there is no bad at talking about. And if they want to talk bad about me, and that's between them and the creator, you know. I this life is too short, man. I need to treat each other right and do right and forgive each other and keep going, man. And you know what? It's just an experience. Now you ended up in the later years, I think around 96, 97, re-signing with WCW when it's WCW now and your brother Eddie and Chavo are in WCW. How was that experience? And was it them that recommended you to WCW or how did that work? No, I was, I was seeking employment. This is what I had done. I had stopped in 90, in 1990. I found, you know, sometimes the wrestlers get by blackballed by promoters and with all due respect, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for promoters, but you guys, I'm talking about promoters and they're listening to me. Promoters, you got to remember that we were sons of a promoter. All of us, Chavo, Mando, myself, Eddie, even Eddie. And we know about the promotion. And so we knew how promotion goes. And so when, when promotion goes what the way it goes, you understand. So not too many promoters like this because we knew what it was. So I could see right through it when they, you know, uh, you know, they were, they were giving Eddie and, and, uh, and Junior the, the opportunities and they were, they were smashing me down. They were, they were killing me by getting beat by guys that in, in I, I, they let a guy that was six year, I mean, six days into, into, you know, I was six, six or seventh match and they had him beat me. The guy, the guy, and they knew that they could they could trust me because I I would create a match, because I'm the I'm the I'm the uh, I'm the senior I'm the I'm the guy that knows how to how to how to dance how to how to dance with the broom, how to wrestle with the broom, and that's the way my dad taught us. You know, I if you can't wrestle, you gotta be you gotta, if you can wrestle with a broom, you can wrestle anybody. So the way they treated me there. A lot had to do with who was in charge then, and I'm not going to name any names. You can you can figure that out on your own. And never treated me right, and took advantage of me. And uh, when I decided to leave, I decided I told my I told Chavo and I told Eddie. I said, "Take care of the name," and I and I said my goodbyes because they didn't they weren't treating me right. They never gave me an opportunity. So okay, so you're okay, so your time has passed. Okay, just tell me, and then I'll leave. You know, don't keep using me. Then use me with guys that that can't even work and couldn't even work in the ring, brother. And and I'm you know and I respect that uh, of uh, of guys that try it and you know. But you know what? This is a craft. You learn your wrestling in the gym, not just because you got a great body. You're a wrestler already. You can't go over there and learn your craft. That's what I talk to. I talk. Uh, I have a. I have a some some uh, I have a consulting business, okay, and it's a wrestling. Uh, you can see it, my my uh, website is hectorwrestlingguerrero.com, and uh, I have a consulting business in there, and I do I do seminars, you know, but you know it's not for free because you know I've I paid my dues, and that's what a lot of wrestlers nowadays don't realize that they they need to pay their dues. A lot of them haven't paid their dues. Now I'm not going to say who pays their dues or who does it. That's for them to know and then them to do it themselves. You know, yes, Guerrero's got an opportunity because of my, my father's fame. But also when you have that opportunity for that one time, if you don't, if you can't go through that door, that opportunity that they give you the first time, they forget you and you go away and that's, that's it. So we had to be good. And my father made us all good. So 
that's a lot of understanding. A little understanding. I mean, I get a little bit serious there because promoters didn't treat me right. And the one with, with, with uh, they always had their, their favorites. And you have to go. And I understand and I, re- I respect that, you know. And uh, but I still and the understanding of that with WCW, there was no there was no respect there. There was no, uh, you know, at least you could have you could have made my pockets a little bit fuller and they did it. You know, they, they used to they they my dad says it said it this way in a long time ago. They prostitute you. And that's what they did to me. They prostituted me. So were you under contract to them or were you on a per appearance basis? No, I was trying to get a contract, but they never gave me. They promised him a bunch of promises. Right. So it's not like Barry Darso who was getting 300 grand a year to put people over. You're getting a a per night deal with no guarantee of continuous work. And it's making your name weaker on the independent scene to do these public jobs. Thank you. You just, you said it. You said it there, and that's the truth, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it because a lot of promoters took advantage of that. And not just me, man. I'm talking about a lot of guys, man. But you know, this is what I've learned about the creator. You know, he 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 puts in the circumstances, and we go through these situations, and how we treat each other, how we forgive each other, that's a good thing. You know, and if some person that does evil to other people, if they don't repent and go direct it, rectify that, they're going to find themselves not in a not not in a nice place in eternity. It is good that they can be able to do the rectifying now, because now you can set it straight. But once you're into eternity, brother, there's no more. There's no turning back. That's the gavel is down. Bam, for the great white throne judgment. And I'm a very strong believer in the in the Creator, and I do. I read, I read, I read my Bible. I read the lost books of Eden. I read uh, the book of Enoch, the book of Jasher, and and, and uh, the, the Jubilees, and you. And if you don't believe in that, my gosh, you know, then you're blind. And I'm hoping that your eyes will be open. Is there any story that you could share with the fans about Eddie that, that they may not have heard before? No, I mean, my brother had, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stories. I mean, golly. Uh, Eddie, Eddie was, remember, Eddie was the youngest of the Guerreros. And uh, like my brother Chavo, he's five years older than I am. My brother Mom was four years older than I am. And my brother Eddie is 13 young, years younger than I am. So with Chavo, he was actually 18 years younger with Mondo. He was actually 17, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, 17 years younger than all of us. So he was he was he was watching us as we ra- we learned to wrestle and we were being uh, broken in in Mexico when we all started in Juarez, Mexico because that's where we all started. Then Chavo went to California, Mando later, and then I later, and my dad also joined in Chavo in California. That success that Chavo had was was an opening door in the American wrestling for the Guerreros at that time. But my dad was the one that called. Uh, well, they called Leo Garibaldi, he was the booker, and he called my dad, who was talking to my dad, and he said, man, we're looking for a Mexican, and we're looking this and this and that, and, you know, that he can do this and he can do that. And then my dad says, that's my son. And so Leo says, can you send him? He says, yeah. So there's where my brother Chavo got his great opportunity, Chavo Sr., Chavo Classic, who you all call. So, yeah, I actually met him a couple of times, and he was a really nice guy. Thank you. Yes, he is. You you did wrestle Eddie twice in WCW, right? Once as yourself yeah. and once as Lasertron on Saturday night. Did you enjoy that at least having those two oh, matches? Yeah. Oh my God, we had fun up there, especially at Lasertron because with me in the mask. When I have this mask, you can't see you can't see my mouth. <laughs> so, so, so I was constantly I was constantly talking. And he couldn't see me, and I'm telling, I'm talking to him, you know, and I'm talking to him. He's like, hey, man, don't make me laugh. (laughs) But, you know, my brother Eddie had so much talent. And my God, he had a little bit of my dad. He had a little bit of Chavo Sr. He had a little bit of Mondo. He had a little bit of me. And then he had a little bit of himself. And then Junior, too, because Junior was influencing them, too. So he had that. And then he had himself. 
And then all the ones that he had wrestled, that's what a lot of people don't understand, is that when you wrestle, like Lex Luger, right? Lex Luger had wrestled against Flair, wrestled against uh, big, big, big names like Flair. And when you start wrestling big, big names like Flair, you start learning a lot. You learn how to lead a match, glide a match, when to go, when not to go, when to listen, and then, you know, when to grapple and when not. And that was, a, that was a, Eddie, Eddie was, Eddie received all of that from all of us. And so at that time, they wanted to make him bad. And what else? And make him, uh, confront him with, with a family member. And me being the older brother, you know, I'm going like, hey, you know, Eddie, you know, you need to behave, blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, we did that little deal. And then he, you know, and then he he got it where he was a, you know, nasty little brother, beats up the older brother. You know what I mean? And that's, 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 that was to make Eddie heal. And we made him a heel. And last question of, of all the feuds that your dad had in the El Paso territory, what was the feud that, that drew the most for your father and why did it draw the most? Okay. There were some, some ones that I've talked about before. And the first ones that I ever saw that really packed the El Paso Coliseum, and it's a pretty big place, not a small place. I can't tell you how much it, it holds, but it holds. So the El Paso Coliseum at that time, the, the, at that time it was 1962, 63, and my dad had some wrestlers in. He had the medics. And the medics were, they, they looked so much alike and they would switch places and in, in matches and, and the red people would be going crazy. No, no, it's the other one. It's the other one. Like if they were in singles matches, we all, one would come with the other. And then the, the one that was getting beat up, you roll out, the, the other one come in the fresh one, you kind of roll out and the other way come in and beat him and the people would be going crazy. So the medics were a big, big draw in El Paso. So then there was also two other bad guys. These that were bad, and then there was other two guys at that time. Was the Mongol, okay, and then the the mummy, Benny Ramirez, you know. And so the Mongol, and so my dad decided to do. You know what? We're going to put the medics versus the Mongol and the mummy. And so they put them two two together. And that was on a, on a, wrestling was on at that time was on. A, Tuesday nights because it started the first time when he started it was on Tuesday nights later on he did it on Monday back when he came back in 1967 66 67 he they started on Monday but on Tuesday nights in 62 63 that's when that happened and guess what it packed up the next time when they brought another that they did like that that's back in the 60s between 67 and, and 73 or in 74 era they brought in uh, Andre the Giant and packed him in. And when El Santo would show up, it always packed up too. So those are the those are the main draws for my dad. El Santo, uh, uh, you know, Andre the Giant, and and uh, and that that time he put the mummy and the medics against each other. <laughs> wow! Do you have an Andre the Giant story at all? Uh, I got so many. <laughs> I uh, let me see. I have one one that, that I can tell you that we were traveling. We were traveling uh, from Port. Well, he had had a, the promoter back then. I won't say your name. Had a problem with his car because he went to pick up Andrew at the airport, and Andrew was so big that he broke his front seat. He was upset. So Andre was in the dressing room. And Portland, and I was there at that time in the Portland, Oregon territory. And I, uh, at that, I happened to uh, to be there that at that wrestling time. That uh, promoter was upset, and uh, I, I offered to volunteer because I had a 1973 ragtop Lincoln Continental two door, and it. And when I put that back seat back and down, it was I couldn't even reach the pedals. So I told uh, I told the promoter at that time. I said, hey, you know, I would like to uh, if you want me to. I'm in the I'm in the same shows he is for the next two weeks here, and we were in the same shows. I was in the earlier matches. You know what I mean? Like preliminaries. He was in the main events. So I said I didn't mind taking him. And uh, he turned around and he was sitting down and he looked at me and he says, "You do that for me, boss." I said, "Yes, sir, I, I would." And so we became very good friends. 
So we were, we were traveling from uh, Portland to Pendleton. So it was about, oh, I'd say be three, four hour drive. So I'm driving and I'm like, he's talking to me and I'm laughing and he's, he's laughing. And I had, the way I could do it, I had to see it all the way back down. He was drinking beer because he drank beer. I seen him drink 48 beers on the way to the matches. So he drank all the way there. I'm talking 48 beers. He walked like a little bunch, sort of way. And so Andre, Andre, uh, we're, we're, I got stopped by the cops because I'm going, I'm going faster than I should because he's making me laugh. I'm talking and I'm laughing. Finally, I get off. I get off the the, the, the thing and the cops giving me the ticket and I'm looking at him. And I'm like, I didn't say anything because I wouldn't want to say nothing. <laughs> And it was drinking beer in the thing. So Andrew gets out of the car. And the car was down, right? Because he's he's heavy. He gets out of the car and the car goes up. And the door opens and he's out, right? And then he comes and this this cop is giving me the ticket like this, right? He's writing it like that. And he goes and he looks at Dinder and he goes. And his eyes went up. And I was looking at him and I wanted to laugh because it just went, it was so funny. And he was like, He's almost like mesmerized, right? And then Andre says, you're going to give him that ticket? And he says, he didn't even say anything. <laughs> so he looked at me and he says, here, finish it. So he finished it. And then he then had time to grab it. And he goes, <laughs> put it in his, in his pocket. And he says, don't worry about it, boss. He says, um, the Portland uh, police chief is my friend. And he walked away. I never saw the, I never saw the ticket. I never paid it. I never paid it because it, it never went on my record, so it got so it got taken care of. Wow, yeah, that doesn't happen too much anymore. But in the old days, there were some benefits to being a wrestler. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, but Andre was of his size. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, and he was such a star too back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He sure was, brother. He sure was. Now I know you have shirts. Is there anything you want to tell the fans the where they could buy those shirts or anything you want to plug before we go here? Well, we got them on our website. You got HectorRussingGuerrero.com. I got it right there. Uh, this is one of my consulting cards, and uh, so that's my consulting card. And and you you can uh, you can actually go and there's a PO box number right there. And also, uh, there's also, uh, let me see if I can do that so I can see it. Let me make sure I'm doing it right there. But the Hector Rossing, uh, Guerrero.com, and then uh, my wife takes care of it. And uh, there's there's uh, there's uh, teas that are sell for sale there. And we, we got a lot of things. Uh, in the future, I'm planning to uh, make these available for some bidding. For some bidding. These are the two original masks. That I used at the very beginning, and they're you can tell they're ring worn because they're all <laughs> really bad. But anyway, that's a situation. Oh, and I, I was also uh, laser trauma for Paco Alonso C uh, CMLL, and he had given me this type of mask. But I can't, I, I won't sell these because that that's his design, and I used this mask when I was uh, in Mexico. And later, later on, turned it blue. And the reason, because the whites get really dirty, so I turn it into a blue mask. So there we go. Anyway. And for those that don't know, it actually is harder to, to wrestle in masks where they have the mesh over the eyes, as I've found over the years. Yeah, yeah. You can't hardly see, you know. And about, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's an interesting, but not worse than those device that I had, like from Gobbledygooker, man. No, that that just that's a that's a story that just wouldn't happen nowadays, where they're literally <laughs> pushing you out the curtain with no practice. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. It was that was not a nice thing situation, but I didn't know who it was. It was they were pushing me, pushing me. All I could see was white, not black, white. <laughs> Maybe it was Bruce Pritchard. No, no, Bruce, no, Bruce is a sweetheart, man. No, he he's actually took care of me when I was there. Okay. He was he with Bruce Pritchard, and I I got no 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 ifies to say with anybody up there. It was you know uh, he seems like a nice guy, but he's a gorilla a lot of the time. So I don't know if it, if it would have been someone a gorilla no. pushing you. No, no, he wouldn't have done that. He wouldn't have done that. And uh, and when I worked for TNA, I, you know, I I, I want to say that that was a great time working for TNA. And I want to thank uh, 
Mike Tenay because Mike Tenay was uh, instrumental in me having that opportunity. And uh, he's a great announcer. I, I even I even compa- compare him with Gordon Soley. That's how good Mike Tenay is. I'm surprised that they're not using him. They are, they are missing out in, in, uh, in a guy that, that knows wrestling and knows lucha and knows wrestling back and forth. The, the repertory he has, the history he has on wrestling is immense, man. And uh, I got a lot of respect for Mike Tenay. I mean, he's one of, my, one, of my, one of my personal friends. And, uh, but they're missing out. On the you, guy. you were an announcer with him, right? You were an announcer in TNA and you managed well, LAX, I think, at one point. Yes, and at, I did that with them. But I also, uh, uh, I, I was a Spanish announcer. You got to remember that I hablo muy bien el español. Soy mexicano y puedo hablar muy bien el español porque es, soy mexicano. So what I'm telling you there is I'm a very Mexican because I speak Mexican. I know how to speak it. So uh, I, uh, I was a you know, translator, and then, uh, you know, I was a color commentator while Willie Urbina, which is a very personal friend of mine, I wish him the best too, and great guy, awesome guy. Uh, he's a- I know he's him not, from Puerto Rico. He used to work yes. for IWA Puerto Rico. Yes, and he's a, and he, we were both uh, the voices there until our contract ran out and uh, they decided to, I guess they were gonna sell because then after we left, then they sold pretty soon later on and then they took, uh, TNA. I mean, they took uh, Impact Wrestling to, to to Canada. Now it's back again in, in Orlando. How I hear, so uh, wrestling has really changed. <laughs> so when I see wrestling now, I go, "Wow!" I go, "I never thought it changed this much." But everything changes. So yeah, I think after AEW came, Impact Wrestling went from kind of took a nosedive in popularity because AEW became the strong number two. Right, 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 right. Maybe yeah. they'll use you there down the road as a commentator. Well, you know, I mean, I I wouldn't say no, but I mean, uh, it all depends, you know, with all the all respect to them. And I have a lot, you know, I'm, I'm a guy that that's, that's going to be honest and I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to teeter tatter for this or that. Either am I going to be over there kissing, you know, somebody's what, but I'm not. Okay. But I am, you know, who I am. And if they can be right, okay. And if not, well, you know, go ahead and do it. You, you know, it's your, it's your show. I can't tell you. I, I know how I would run it. I know how us Guerrero's ran it when we had our own, you know. You know, I know how we ran it. And I, our father taught us to, to run it with, with diplomacy, taught us to run, uh, to run it with, with honesty and being right with all the guys. And they loved us because of that. If we would tell them flat out right, you know, you were going to get used or you weren't going to be used or what your what your position was. Not any lies like they've done to some of us in this business. And I talk about all wrestlers to some of us. And I say all wrestlers in this business. Well, I thank you a lot for being so generous your, with your time. Uh, it's been very interesting hearing your stories. And I'll let you close this interview off with whatever you want to tell the fans. Well, I want to tell you uh, one thing is I want to say is uh, don't don't ever think there is not a creator. There is a creator, and uh, he's, he's he's in everything. He's the one that made the earth. He's the one that, if you think about it, it's got a divine creation. So if that's where you see, you're going to find it, and you will realize that he is true and he's real, more real than we are here on the earth. So. That's my big thing. I tell you, I tell a lot of people, I even tell people that, that, you know, for every action, there's a reaction. That's a law of science. And I'm a teacher, so I know that. So every, every, every action has a reaction. Every uh, You plant apples, you're going to get apples. You do good, your good's going to come back. You do bad, it's going to come back. It's better to come back to this lifetime if you're doing bad than to come back later because after that, it goes, it acts forever. You might not understand that, but you may someday. And as far as wrestling goes, I, I reach out to all you wrestlers that you call yourself superstars or anything that you think you are. Learn your craft. Stay humble and do right. And remember that, you know what? This is an entertainment sport. I say it again. This is an entertainment sport. Okay? It's been 
way before me, people said it, okay? Jim Hurd, Vince McMahon, many have said it. It's an entertainment sport. So remember that. Learn your craft, have fun, enjoy it, and make people love you. And people, if you're the bad guy, make people hate you so that it can be a fun time. And remember that there is a creator and he watches everything we do. All right. Thank you. Thank you. For Thank you offer. for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any 